أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله إلا بالله العلي العظيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا والشفيع نفوسنا والطبيب ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الأولين والآخرين إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد صلوات على محمد وآل محمد مؤمنين مؤمنات brothers and sisters in Islam and Iman سلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته First and foremost, I'd like to extend my condolences to all the mu'mineen, mu'minat that are present here. عَدَّمَ اللَّهُ أُجُورُنَا وَأُجُورُكُمْ بِمُصَابِنَا بِعَبِي عَبْدِ اللَّهِ الْحُسَيْنِ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ اللَّهُمَّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ Secondly, I'd like to also thank all of you, the Masumi Islamic Center, for the kind invitation, for all of you who are present here. Uh, who will help, inshallah, make these majalis something beneficial for all of us together. Before we begin uh, this short, you know, four-night series, uh, culminating with the day Arba'in program, normally I'd like to go through, you know, a few different disclaimers. You know, one of the most difficult things for any speaker, at least for myself, I don't know about anybody else, but it's tough coming to a community trying to figure out what topics are going to work for what community. It's a very, very tough thing to do. You know, there might be certain things that I myself, I'm personally, personally interested in, right, in terms of history or akhlaq or philosophy or irfan or something. And I can try to deliver that in the best way possible, but, you know, you could not be interested at all in any of those things. So even if, let's say, sometimes there's a mutual interest, right, maybe the topic is interesting. Like, okay, this historical event is interesting. This akhlaqi point might be interesting. Or hearing about some theological, philosophical, irfani point, okay, maybe it's good. But sometimes, like, okay, well, we've heard it before, though, right? So it's, it's repeat. So it's impossible to kind of get a sense of demographics, right, to get a sense of people's spiritual journeys and things like that. Really, the only way, and, you know, I try to do my due diligence. You know, I spoke with different individuals. You know, first and foremost, I did speak with Sheikh Jafar, right, to get his... Uh, you know, advice and insights on you know, what might be some good topics to address. But at the end of the day, some of it, at the very least, will rest upon all of you, right? You, Azadaran, who are here sitting in this you know, beloved maqam and sitting there trying to connect yourself with the message of Karbala. So when that happens, you know, after tonight at least, we'll try to move in a certain trajectory. And the only way I'll have an idea of whether it's something that seems like it could go in the right direction, whether it's beneficial, is if we're going to have some sort of mutual feedback, right? So you don't have to feel shy, no taqalluf, no ta'aruf, nothing like that. If something seems off, it's like, you know, that's, it's good, but, you know, we've done that before, whatever it is, then, you know, let me know afterwards, no problem. If you feel like it's, you're too shy, I'm not going to bite, I promise. I'm not going to slap you or anything if you say something, right? If I don't like, it's okay. I do it in every other community, right? You're not, you're special, but you're not that special. I tell everybody, don't worry. So you can come and tell me. If you still feel shy, you're like, no, I can't go to this guy. This guy's from New Jersey. I don't know what these guys are about. I'm a little scared. No problem. Tell any of the, the board members, right, the members of the MCEC, anybody else, and they can come and tell me too, right? That's fine as well. What I, you know, really hate to happen is that, you know, that, you know, we go through this series in the, you know, these four nights and then, you know, culminating in the, 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 you know, the Masaib of Arba'in, and that it's, you know, it was okay, but we didn't really hear anything new. We didn't really benefit. I mean, khair. Just doing the dhikr of Ahlul Bayt is benefit enough, of course. But the reason that we're here and that we don't just do Masaib every day, right? all these majalis, right? the classical majalis was just poetry and Masaib, that's it. One thing that we have over the years added on is that no, we need some sort of lecture portion. Whether it's fada'il, whether it's history, whether it's akhlaq, some sort of reminder. You know, there's something else that we want to attach. And it's this idea that, look, if 
we are trying to reconnect with the Ahlul Bayt, we need to make sure we understand truly what they stand for, right? And they're, yeah, definitely in a community like this, when you have, you know, a resident island like Sheikh Jafar, I'm sure you guys have a very strong trajectory and you've been moving alongside him and, you know, moving forward. I, I don't deny that. But I want to make sure that it's something that it makes sense for all of you guys, right? So I'm hoping that the feedback works. And sometimes I might get feedback as well too, right? If, let's say, I ask a question, because sometimes I do like a little interaction too, right? I know not everybody likes the monologue. I don't like it myself either. So if I ask a question, I'm hoping that you know, we get some sort of responses as well too. So hopefully this will be mutually beneficial for all of us, inshallah ta'ala. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. You know, even when we look at all the different times that we commemorate you know, this ayam of azah that we have, each and every event almost has its own sort of feeling, gham and masaib to it, right? There are certain themes and elements that stick out to us at one certain time that maybe doesn't stick out as much in the other. So obviously, when we're in the ashra, those first 10 nights or 12 nights, our focus is pretty much primarily towards Imam Hussain, right? That's, that's the way it is. Yes, obviously, we know Bibi Zainab's there, Imam Sajjad's there, the other shuhada are there. It's there, but it's primarily the ashra of Imam Hussain. That's the way that you know, we connect with it. When we move past that, past Karbala, past Ashura, and move towards Arba'in, that's where we start to shift our focus a bit more towards Imam Sajjad, towards Bibi Zainab, towards the women, the children, right? Those sort of themes. Especially if we're thinking about it historically and in terms of the Masaib. More, you know, specifically, once we're getting closer to Arba'in, now the whole idea of ziyarah itself, especially the ziyarah of Arba'in, that is something that's first and foremost at, you know, front and center in our minds and our hearts, I think, right? For a lot of people. And, you know, Sheikh Jafar talked about it you know, earlier today in the, um, you know, wonderful program that was held, is that this idea of ziyarah is something really, really important. And of course, you know, we pray, we ask Allah that, you know, those who are there for ziyarah now, we ask Allah to make that journey, that ziyarah for them spiritually beneficial. We ask that they return safely here, inshallah, and that their benefit that they've gained from there is something that will also extend to us, you know, almost like in an osmosis kind of fashion, inshallah. And then we get the tawfiq year after year to go and also perform the ziyarah as well. Now, just because we're not physically there, we all know very well that the riwayat are clear. You can do ziyarah from anywhere. You and I from here, we can do ziyarah as well. We can recite the ziyarah. Now, normally when we talk about ziyarah, we talk about performing ziyarah, reciting ziyarah. And I know Sheikh Jafar had asked somebody, you know, asked one of the youth, what does it mean? And says, you know, ziyarah or za'ir or zawad, right? It means a pilgrim, right? a visitor, somebody who's going. Now I want to focus on that concept for the first few minutes of this. If you can recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So yeah, being a za'ir, performing ziyara, reciting ziyara, all of this, it's a type of amal, it's an action, it's an ibadah. Is it simply just going physically and you know, visiting a holy personality? No, we know it's beyond that because obviously we know we can do it from far away. So it's not a physical visitation. That's one form of it, but that's not you know, the end thing. There's something beyond that, okay. So since we can do it from far away, we know that there's some spiritual element involved too. So okay. So what is that spiritual element then? What is that deeper thing within ziyara that we should keep in mind? Well, you know, the wonderful thing about the Arabic language is when you focus on the, the actual meanings of the words themselves, it opens up things for us too. We don't have to go and, you know, dive into, you know, you know sit there and wait for some makashifa and like special ilham to come to us and then figure out what's the deeper meaning. No, even in the Arabic itself, it reveals some deeper understandings of, of these concepts. So one of the deeper meanings of this idea of ziyara is that it has to do with care, love, and attention, and focus. One of the meanings of ziyara, or being a za'ir, is that you are giving your care, your attention, and your focus to one thing or one person. And that therefore means by, you know, by extension that everything and everybody else then becomes you know, secondary. It's almost as if they become non-existent. And now we can see how that makes sense. From a simple perspective, right? When we go and perform the ziyara, when we go and visit, whether it's any of the aima, whether 
you know, we go to see any of these holy personalities, right? We go to Sham, visit Bibi Zainab, alayhi salam, wherever we're going, Jazakallah khair. When we go there, we all know that they become our main focus there, right? Everything that we're thinking about is them. We're thinking about that personality, what they've done, their fada'il, the masaib that happened to them. The hotels that we're staying in, that doesn't matter. The food that we eat, doesn't matter. Our, our luggage gets lost, no big deal, right? There's some issues that happen. If somebody bumps us while we're trying to get close to the dhari. These things go out the door, right? For somebody who's truly a zair. They don't care about these dunyawi things anymore. They're like, look, my focus is Hussein, it's Ali, it's, Has it's any of these personalities. That's the main focus. That's where everything goes, right? So that means there's one point of focus, one axis, everything else becomes almost non-existent. And this meaning is not something simply relegated and specific to just the Ahlul Bayt. This goes for everything. So if we're talking about visitation too, even when you and I go and visit somebody, right? You get invited for, for dinner. When you go there, when you go in, let's say sometimes you get multiple invites, right? For dinner, for coffee, for house majalis, right? Sometimes there's multiple ones that happen. When you and I make a conscious, intentional decision to go to somebody's house, to accept their invitation, we are becoming a zayr of that person too. We're saying, you right now matter to me more than everybody else, and for everybody else becomes non-existent, right? Your majlis, or that food, or your company, that's what matters to me right now. And sometimes even if it's people that we may not like so much, but look, even though I may not like you, I may not fully enjoy your company, but I'm still giving you my full focus and attention right now, right? So even in normal types of visitation, or seeing somebody, or meeting somebody, we still have this you know, kind of meaning there too. Focus, care, love, and attention for one thing, everything else is just you know, out the door. Now, I want to go beyond this a little bit more, too. If you can recite us, Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. I want to focus back on this idea of focusing, of giving your attention. Let's say now that I'm speaking to the, the kids. Right? We're busy, we're playing a video game, we're on our phone, we're doing something. And all of a sudden, our parents call us, right? They say, Hassan, Ali, Muhammad, Fatima, Zainab, Zahra, you know, come here. You know, what happens a lot of the times? Well, I mean, if you're playing online, there's no pause. You can't pause multiplayer, right? If you're online, there's no pause there. But yes, you play single player, you can pause if you really want to. Otherwise, there's no pause there. You usually say what? Hold on. Why? Because where's the focus and attention? It's on the game. If you're on the phone with somebody, your focus is with them. If you're doing anything, reading something, social media, whatever it is, the focus and attention is there. Somebody else might be calling and inviting, but you say, look, what we're really saying at that point is that this game or this movie or this TV show or whatever it is, this person that I'm talking to or playing with, they are getting my full attention right now. And sorry, you, mama, baba, mom, dad, right now, I'm not going to give you my full attention. So the amount of love and care that I have, I'm not going to give it to you right now. It's going to go somewhere else. Maybe when I'm done, then I can shift focuses. But right now, that's, you're not it. You're not my first priority. That's what we're really saying, right? And all the parents are like, yeah, see, kids, are you listening? OK, parents, let me come back to you now, too, right? When your kids are calling you, says, you know, I'm me, daddy. Let's, let's, can you go play? Can you look at this with me? Can, you, you know, can I talk to you? And sometimes we're sitting there. Sometimes it's work messages, right? Or sometimes we're relaxing after work, whatever it is, and we're sitting there like, uh huh, X second, X second, one second, one second, right? And we're just sitting there, same thing. What is the child seeing? Exact same thing. Deep down, they understand my mom, my dad, their focus, care, and attention goes to this and not to me. Their love, their focus is for that device or for work or for somebody else, and it's not for me right now. So it's not just the kids that you know, need to hear this. We as parents need to hear this as well, too, right? Now, we have that there. I want to go beyond that a little bit. If you can recite, A salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Parents calling, children calling parents, parents calling children, siblings calling each other. Okay. Now let's kick it up a notch. What was the call that was made on Ashura, on the afternoon of Ashura? What did Imam Hussein say? When he's all alone on the battlefield. Hal min nasirin yansurna. Anybody out there to help me? Now, what was he doing? Right? Let's think about it for a second. Was he actually asking, say, hey, can some of you guys in you know, uh, Umar ibn Saad's army, can you come and help me out? Was he talking to the women in the tents or the children in the tents? What is he doing? 
Now, somebody might say, yeah, maybe he's trying to convince them. OK, that's one possibility. I don't think it's a strong possibility, but maybe. Maybe it's something else. Maybe he's calling out, and maybe people are recording it so that somebody like you and I sitting right here, we can hear that call and decide whether or not we want to answer or not. We can decide, OK, Imam, you're calling me. Do I want to shift my focus to whatever I'm doing right now and give you my full attention, my love, and my care? Do I want to do that for you, Imam, or not? We can decide whether to do that or not. Now, OK, let's just say, I'm sure everybody here would say, yes, Imam, of course, I'm going to answer you. Right? Labaik ya Hussain. We'll all say it. OK, what does that mean? Besides saying the slogans, what does that mean to actually give our attention to the Imam? I said, OK, well, we can take it beyond that. We can say, the Imam made that call for a specific reason. With that reason, we are hearing, again, in his words, this is coming from when he is initially starting his mission. right? That call, who he's asking people, come and help me, come and help me. Well, what are the types of people who are really going to answer him and help him? Well, we can go back to the whole point for him leaving and making his movement towards Kufa and then being misdirected or directed towards Karbala. What did this all start with in the first place? Now, nowadays, everybody has their own idea about what the Husseini mission is, right? Everybody has their own ideas about what it could be. We don't need to make it up. We don't need to grab some you know, cool social media trend and say, this is what Imam Hussein stood for. We don't need to force feed any ideas to Imam. He said it himself. I am rising up. I'm leaving this place to go and seek after Islah. Now, I don't know how many of you listened to the Thursday night program at JCC, but we mentioned over there, Islah, how do people normally translate Islah? What's the usual translation that you guys are familiar with for Islah? Reformation, right? That's what people usually say, Reformation. So I'm going to be a little controversial here, or maybe not. I don't like that translation at all. I think it's a terrible translation. Why? When we think of not just the English word Reformation, for those of you who know a little bit of history, especially European history, what comes to your mind? Protestant Reformation, right? Christians. What's happening there is they're taking their deen, they're taking their religion and saying, look, whatever religion we had was broken, it was messed up, now we got to change it. Is that what Imam's doing? Is he saying, no, the deen is broken, it's messed up, I need to fix it? I need to reform it to something new? No, not at all. Reformation is a terrible, terrible translation because of the context that we have in the West, that we should have if we you know. If you tell somebody, you know, our Imam, the grandson of the Prophet, he rose to reform the religion. Well, when you think about reformist scholars, what comes to your mind too? Liberalism, secularism, individualism, right? Where they stand for all these ideologies, but clearly, I'm sure most of you don't stand for it yourself. And no way you can say Imam Hussein stood for those ideologies. Like, okay, so reformation, being a reformist, clearly is not the right word. Okay, so what word can we use? Well, okay, let's, let's think a bit more. Again, the Arabic does all the work for us. Islah, the opposite of islah is ifsad. Ifsad, yani fasad. What is fasad? What does it mean to cause fasad fil ard? What does that mean? Corruption, chaos, right? To make things go haywire, to make them go crazy. What it means is that things are in a normal state of equilibrium. Things are going fine. It's normal. Somebody comes along and messes it all up. And now things are, are going crazy. That's fasad. It's chaos now. The opposite of that chaos is islah. And now I'll give you another form of that. And you might have a better idea of another way we can translate islah. Islah is related to the word sulh. You should know the word sulh, right? What is sulh? What is the most famous sulh that you and I should know? Sulh of Imam Hassan alayhi salam, right? Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So, okay, sulh is a treaty, right? So it's a, it's a peace treaty, right? Now, what does a peace treaty have to do with reformation, right? Like, okay, let's, let's see. Sulh is what? What is a peace treaty in the first place? Right? The idea is this. Right now, there's two parties or multiple parties engaging in war. Is war the normal state of human affairs? It's not. What was the normal state? It was peace. Then we broke that by causing facade somehow, or somebody else engaged in war. Then we went into chaos. And now the sulh comes in to try to what? No, we need to take it back to the way it was. Right? We had peace. It got taken to chaos, to facade. Now we want to go back to that piece. That's what a sul is doing. It's not reforming things. What is it doing? It's restoring things. So islah is not reformation. It's what? It's restoration. 
So now what is Imam Hussein alayhi salam doing? He's saying, I'm not reforming this religion. I'm not reforming the ummah. I'm taking what was already there that was brought down by my grandfather and you Muslims have left that. You've left that and put society into chaos and now I need to restore it back to the way it originally was. I'm restoring it back to the original message of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. I'm trying, Imam Hussein saying, I'm trying to restore things back to the way Allah intended. He sent down the Prophet with the Quran, with these rules and regulations. This is how you act with one another, you know, all these things. And one by one, right, the Muslims started to just move away, little by little, right? It just started to move so far away that at the time of Yazid, there's almost nothing left of Islam anymore. To think that the Muslims could allow somebody like Yazid to be their leader. Like, that's how bad the Muslims got. They were okay with somebody like that who openly is like, yeah, this religion's a game, who cares, this is all nonsense, it's not even real. That is a Muslim leader? Amazing, right? Can you imagine allowing, imagine somebody comes on the member and says that, oh yeah, this religion's fake, but you know, I'm just gonna give a speech anyway. You'd hopefully pull that person off right away. Hopefully you'd never invite somebody like that in the first place, but man, it's, it's strange, right? That this person is now the leader of the Muslim empire. That's what the Muslims are allowed to do. And that leadership, tells what's going on amongst the general people, right? That's very, very telling of them. Okay, let's go back to what we were saying. We're talking about this ziyada, this love, this care, this attention, that, and this focus. Imam is calling us to say, look, this message is for you and I too, right? You want to do my ziyada? Okay, well, I made a call. Are you going to answer? We say, yeah, we'll do it by words. Maybe we'll do it physically too. He says, no, I want it spiritually. Okay, well, what do we mean by spiritually? Well, Imam saying himself, well, I rose up to restore things back to the way they were. Have you also done the same thing? Have you restored yourself back to the way that Allah had intended and Rasulullah had intended? Are you acting by the tenets of Islam? Are you acting by the tenets of the Quran? Are you acting by the way this is? This is real Islam. Are you doing that or not? If you're not, then that hal min nasir and yansurana labbaik doesn't really mean much. What is it going to mean then if we're saying labbaik, but many other people they were the same ones who called Imam Hussein in the first point in Kufa, right? They said to him first, Labbaik, Labbaik, come. And then when things got rough, they got tough, they were standing opposite Imam Hussein as well. They called him first, and then Imam himself says right in front of them in, uh, in Karbala, he said, Look, I've got your names right here in these letters. Your name is right, your signature is over here. You, 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 you called me here, and now you've got swords against me. You've killed all my family members. Like, what are you doing here? And they were just so deluded. They were like, no, 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 that's fake. That's a lie. Because they, they were munafiqeen at that point, right? They had completely lost everything. Now, we all think about the Ahl Kufa, these, these people from Sham, like, ah, oh, these, these villains are so terrible, so bad. Well, the people, they, they prayed, they fasted, they read Quran. According to some historians, Umar ibn Sa'd himself was hafid of Quran. It's like, okay, so they're doing all the Muslim stuff. They're checking all these boxes. Something else is missing. So before we want to toss them and throw them under the bus, like, oh, bad guys, they're so bad. Oh, we don't like Yazid, we don't like Umar bin Saad, they've been Ziyad, all bad people. Okay, but maybe my actions might be pretty similar to theirs. Maybe my way of thinking about Islam might be similar to theirs too. I could be calling my Imam at the time right now, and he might come, and I might be on the wrong side. Because the message of the Dajjal might be very similar to what the message of uh, was of, of Ibn Ziyad and Yazid and Umar bin Saad. So let's go a step further and let's figure out if we can solve this. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. So I think it's obvious, it shouldn't be controversial to say, the Imam, whether it's the Imam of that time or of our time, is not looking for Muslims. To be a Muslim, let's be honest, is very, very easy. Right? What does it take to be a Muslim? It's two lines, right? Again, bare bones, bare minimum Muslim, right? Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. That's it, magic. That's it. You're a Muslim now, right? That's it. That's all you have to do. You, can, you and I can do every single sin that exists, and technically we're still Muslims, not great ones, but we're still Muslims, right? 
So, okay, so there's something beyond being a Muslim. There's something beyond Islam that we have to try to figure out. And there is something beyond that. If you look in the Quran, you look in the Riwayat, there is. There is different stations and maqamat that are mentioned very clearly. One of them that's mentioned is Iman, meaning that there is a difference between being a Muslim and being a Mu'min. There's a difference between Islam and Iman. And there's many riwayat. I'll just share one from Imam al-Baqir alayhi salatu wassalam. He's reported to have said, Al-Islam iqrarun bil amal. What is Islam? He says, Islam is iqrar. It's just you say stuff. You testify. You bear witness. It's, yeah, this is what I do. This is what I believe. Bil amal. But you don't really act upon it. But he says, what iman iqrarun bil amal. You get both there. Iman is what? You say this stuff and then you act upon it too. You say, I believe in Allah and then you follow him through. I believe in the Quran and I follow through on that. I believe in the message of the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt and I follow them. I believe in this system of marja'iyah and I follow through with that too. I believe in this perfect moral system that has been passed down and I treat people based on that system. All of this stuff, right? It's, it's simple. I have actions and I have, they're in line with my beliefs. I have beliefs and they're in line with my actions. I'm not a munafiq. I don't just say stuff randomly, but not do it. I say this stuff and I do it too. That's what a mu'min is. So if we're being honest here, if we're looking at perhaps what Imam is saying is that he's not just asking for any Muslim helper. He's saying, where's the mu'mineen? Where are the mu'mineen? Right? You don't really see in the Quran Allah saying that the Muslims are the best ones. The Muslims are the ones who are going to succeed. Qad aflahal mu'minun. Right? Surah mu'minun right there in the beginning. Qad aflahal mu'minun. Who are the ones who are going to get falah and success? Mu'minun. Right? And many times in the Quran, Allah says the same thing. But again, I don't want to go through all the pieces of evidence because I know it's obvious for everybody who's sitting here. Okay. So now, we want to do ziyara, the spiritual connection. We want to answer to the imam properly, not just by tongue, not just by words, not by just some abstract belief. We want to go beyond and turn our actions right, into something. Okay. We know that all this is connected to the original message of Islam. Okay, I got that too. And there's something though that there's still this kind of gap that I'm, I'm, you know, we have to figure out. And if we tie all of this stuff together, which is the problems of the Muslims of the past, not being able to act upon what they believed, and for you and I right now, who, let's be honest, we attend these majalis year after year, we're coming, some of you are, are veter veteran Azadaran, right? You've been attending 30, 40, 50, 60 years, we've been, you know, we've been attending a majalis. You've been sitting here crying over the gham and masaib, beating our chests, having our hearts break over hearing these stories. Ulama have been coming and sitting on a member like this, mentioning akhlaqi points, you know, treat people like this, think about this, do this. Here's some history lessons for you, reflect on history. Here's some points about aqidah and aqaid and whatever. People have been doing this. In Ramadan they come, let's connect you with the Quran, let's do some tafsir, let's build your relationship there. On these various occasions, wiladat, shahadat, let's give you the fadail, let's talk to you, let's tell you the stories of the Ahlul Bayt. They're your role models, act like them. And what happens after all of this is done, filling our year with all these events, we're still doing ghibah, we're still lying, we're still cheating, we still delay our namaz sometimes, our salah, we make excuses, we treat each other in a way that is unbecoming of the name of being a Shia of Ali. Like, well, how is that possible? How is it that after all of this, that same problem that existed for those Muslims back then, the ones that we don't like and we do la'na and all them, like, okay, but if I'm being honest, some of that problem might exist in me too, though. If I really want to be honest. Like, okay, what's going on? What's this sort of common thread that, and this common, let's say, problem or crisis or issue that is tying us all together but in a bad way? Like, why are we not able to act sometimes upon all these different ideas? And the way that perhaps, and this is what I submit to you, is perhaps the reason why this is happening is because you and I have been suffering from an identity crisis. You and I are confused about who we really are. We don't know what it means to be a real Muslim or a Mu'min or a Shia. We have all these terms in our mind, all of these kind of abstract, vague ideas, but when it comes time to act, then we're like, oh, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't get it. There's something wrong with our identity. There's something that's missing over there. And that's what I want to try to investigate in the few minutes that we have left tonight and then for the next few nights, inshallah ta'ala. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.
might say, look, Hassan, I'm, I don't really, I'm not really seeing this sort of identity thing. What are we talking about here? What is this crisis? Look, if I ask any of you right now, I say, look, tell me about your identity. Who are you? What kind of answers will you give me? You know, describe yourself to me. Again, don't say it out loud. You don't have to now. But normally, if you ask somebody, hey, tell me about yourself, what are the typical answers that people give? Now, now you can ask, right? When you're getting to know somebody, they tell me about yourself. What kind of information do people give? What do you think? Somebody asks you, you know, tell me about yourself, what do you say? Name, right? Okay. So what else? If I said, sorry? Ethnicity, right? Somebody said ethnicity, right? So your ethnic background, country of origin, stuff like that, right? Okay. What else? Especially in the West, what do people do? Job, right? Ask something, right? It's like, tell me about yourself. Well, I'm a doctor, I'm an engineer, uh, I'm a lawyer, I'm a cat food taste tester, whatever your job is, right? Like, so people just tell you what they're doing. This is the way people seem to identify themselves, right? At a superficial level, at least. Now, a name, is that a real identifier, a marker for us? No, not really. I could make up my name right now and you guys can call me that. People have pen names and pseudonyms and all these other things. It doesn't really change their true identity, does it? That's not who they really are. Ethnic background, does that really matter too much? No, some people, they do pride themselves, let's be honest. Like, oh, I'm a Pakistani, or I'm an Indian, or I'm an Afghan, or I'm Iranian, or uh, I don't know, what do you call somebody from Papua New Guinea? Papua New Guinean? I don't, I don't know, like the, the term for that, right? And some people take it very seriously, right? I'm Canadian, I'm American, I'm, 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 I'm Deutsch, whatever it is, like, this is it, this is who I am. Like, okay, does that really identify who you are? Who you are? What, is it baseball and maple syrup for you guys? I don't know. <laughs> Hockey, I don't know what your identifying markers are. I'm coming from America, right? So it's, for us, it's, it's, not, not, it's not positive stuff. Let's say American things, so, right? Is, is that what really defines us? Like, okay, maybe let's go beyond this. You know, the way that when we're thinking about different identity markers, sometimes we go, look, no, 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 no. My true identity, my real identity, has to do with my value system. My job is not really about my values, right? I could be a doctor, engineer, I could be you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, a custodian, I can be a driver. None of that really affects who I am deep down. That's not gonna change anything. That's just a way to you know, earn halal income, that's all. Doesn't change anything, like okay. So values though, okay, no, my values define who I am. Okay, so tell me more, okay, values. I'm a Democrat, or I'm a Republican, or I'm a conservative, or I'm a liberal, or I'm a progressive, right? All these sort of terms. Like, okay, does that define who you really are? People are switching these things left and right too, right? Like, okay, well that's telling us a little bit more, but let's go beyond that. Somebody might say, no, 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 it's, it's more. It's about my religious values. Like, okay, I'm a conservative Muslim, or I'm a liberal Muslim, or progressive Muslim, reformist Muslim, moderate Muslim, or a spiritual Muslim. What a spiritual Muslim is to this date, I have no idea. We'll talk a little bit about that group, inshallah, but I'm, I'm still a little confused about them. But huh. sometimes people go there. It's like, okay, is that really who you are though? Like, hold on, no, 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 let's go a bit deeper. You see, the reason why we speak like this, we give these sort of answers, right? No, give me blue or red, right? Left or right wing, give me one of those. In our kind of psychology, we are primed to just divide people up into this way or that way. You gotta pick one side or the other. You're either with me or against me, right? That's how everything is. In our normal daily life, pop culture, media, everybody focuses on just pigeonholing and putting people into one or the other category, right? It's all over. Again, politics, you know. Pick one side, that's all you get. You only get this way or that way. Religion, conservative or liberal, you only get to pick one side, that's the way it is. And again, in pop culture and stuff too, you get the same thing. You're either an Autobot or a Decepticon. There is no middle ground. You're an assassin or a Templar. You're a Jedi or a Sith, right? You, you only get a few choices, that's it, there's two choices. You don't get any middle ground there. Although, for those who are Star Wars fans, there are Grey Jedi and Dark Jedi. Okay, I mean, if you know your stuff, then you know your stuff, but Marvel or DC, you gotta pick one, right? It's always one or the other, that's the way it is. And it's funny because it seems like somebody or some group has set that up very simply to make sure any real nuance and, and discussion about our identity goes out the door. If they start giving us these labels, these fake identity labels, that'll get us very confused. We'll be arguing and discussing the wrong things. Whatever the media tells us, we start you know, arguing about that and debating about this, right? I don't know how bad it is for you guys over here. I mean, come on, I know that America is the butt of everybody's joke. Yeah, I, I know how it is. It's really bad in America. Come on. The discussions are terrible. The media is terrible. Mainstream, it's really bad. You know, somebody comes, some pundit comes, says, let's talk about this, and everybody starts going crazy talking about it. Like, why are we talking about this? And it's even happened to Muslims. 
Muslims get caught up in this stuff too, in the circus of what's going on in the mainstream media, right? This distractive media that happens out there. Say, so, okay, no. Let's ask this question a different way. Forget somebody else looking for an answer about who we are. You know, maybe you're weird like me. Sometimes, you know, you're just laying down at night, can't really sleep, right? The insomnia kicks in. Maybe you had too much chai. I don't know what happened. And you're just, you can't sleep. So now your mind is racing, you're thinking, right? Sometimes it happens when you're in the shower too, right? You're doing something, your mind goes somewhere else. You start thinking about all these deep philosophical questions. And one of those questions sometimes is, I, you know, who am I really? Like, what am I really about? Like, who am I deep down? Like, there's all these thoughts and ideas and voices in my head, all this stuff that's, that's kind of stuck in there. I really want to know what I am really about. What is my true self, my true identity? We phrase it different ways, but that same question, I think everybody, every single one of us has had something, some kind of spark like that at one point in our lives, right? Now, when we ask it like that, what is our answer that we give there? Do we jump to the idea of Tawheed and being Abdullah and Ibadullah right away? Is that our first response that, no, I'm a creation of Allah, I'm a slave and servant of Allah? Is that our first thought? Unfortunately, I don't think it is. I don't think that's the first thing that our mind or our heart or our nafs jumps to. It's usually one of these other categories, right? And you see now, without getting too sociopolitical, you see what the rest of the society is doing. Because they have no sense of truth out there. What do they do? Hey, you make up whatever identity marker that you want. Because there's nothing real, there's nothing objective, there is no such thing as truth. You get to define yourself any way that you want. You want to be a boy in the morning and a girl at night? Go right ahead. Who cares? No problem. You want to be a human in the morning and identify as a toilet at night? Go right ahead. Like, nobody can say anything to you, right? What can you do? It's like, no, it's my life. It's not harming you. Like, what, do you <laughs> what do you mean? You're harming yourself. What, what kind of crazy thought is that? What do you mean you can identify as whatever you want? That truth is whatever you want it to be. And now it's so forceful that we have to succumb and agree with what they're saying too. It's not just that they're saying, hey, let me live my life. You know, don't, it doesn't affect you. Now they're saying, no, use my pronouns, identify this way, and you have to be proud of the fact that I identify myself this way. Right? They're pushing everything like that. They're trying to say, look, you cannot be proud of your true identity anymore, but our, not me, <laughs> them, wait, what, left, this is my left, right? You know what I mean by left, right? Yeah. They're saying, no, you have to be proud of what we're saying. You can't be proud of your own self, though. All your religious stuff, no, that's barbaric. That's backwards. You can't be proud of that. But us, us on the left, or you know the, you know what I mean, the Rainbow Rangers, the Alphabet Group, all those types, they'll say, no, you got to be proud of us. Like what? We get a whole month to ourselves too, and you have to, you know, wave the flags and everything. But why? Why do we have to be proud of that? And why are you saying that we can't be proud of ourselves? If everybody's allowed to do whatever and say whatever, why does our religion get tossed in the dirt? Why are we just, you know, shoved? And then the worst part is, many of us, again, as being children of immigrants and all these other things, sometimes we naturally, us from the East, we are introverted. Let's be honest. We don't like confrontation. So when somebody starts to challenge us, we like kind of you know, squirm and kind of curl up into a ball, say, no, 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 it's fine. Whatever you guys want to do, right? Yeah, freedom, 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 yeah, yeah, whatever you want. We take our ideas and we just swallow them, say, no, 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 don't worry about it. Your identity, whatever you say, that's, that's what's true. Can that be a person who says, I don't know. It sounds like it's not the case. It sounds like there's something wrong with us and our true identity. Every single one of us, if we were answering it on a Sunday school quiz, say, what are, is our real identity? We say, yes, we are lovers of Allah, lovers of the Ahlul Bayt. We are slaves of Allah, creations of Allah. We're Muslims, we're Mu'min. That's how we would answer it. But when it comes to acting upon it, then something else happens. When it comes to defending it, something else happens. When it comes to somebody challenging us on it, we're done. We go silent and our identity goes out the door. So there's been some crisis that's going on over here where we've forgotten who we are. Let me share an ayah of Quran with you. If you can recite, Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <laughs> this comes in Surah Al Hashar, Surah 59, Ayah 19. Very short, but it's very powerful. Allah says there, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa la takunu kaladina nasullah, fa ansahum anfusahum ulaikahum al fasiqun. Okay, let's go piece by piece. Don't be like those who did nisyan of Allah. What is nisyan? Forget. Don't be like those who forgot about Allah. Why? What happens? Allah tells me. What happens when somebody forgets about you? I will make them, or Allah says, uh, yeah, 
I am going to make them forget their nafs. Ya'ani, I will make them forget who they really are. You forget me, I'm going to make you forget yourself. Why? Because they go hand in hand. You forget about Allah, then you don't know who you really are. Ula'ika hum al These individuals end up becoming fasiq. Openly transgressing, rebelling, saying that they don't care about Allah anymore. They don't care about Islam anymore. So now, again, you can reverse engineer this. We, sometimes we act like fasiqeen. Let's, again, sorry, I know that word is a little tough, but let's be honest. Sometimes we're out on social media pushing stuff out that we shouldn't be. We say stuff that we shouldn't. We use language we shouldn't. We're doing things we shouldn't be doing. And it's, sometimes it's open. So how did we become a fasiq? How did we just openly go against Allah like that? Allah is saying, okay, let's reverse engineer then. You're somebody who goes against me. Well, that's because you forgot who you really were. How did I forget my identity? How did I forget who I really was? Allah said, because you forgot who I am. You forgot me, so I made you forget you, and that's why you ended up just leaving me. Now, again, you're saying, wait, what do you mean? I didn't, Allah, I didn't forget you. Come on, Allah, what are you talking about? I'm praying three, five times a day. I'm doing the tasbih. I'm coming to the majalis. Like, didn't we just talk about that like 10 minutes ago? That No, we're going through all this stuff. I'm remembering you, Allah, all the time. That, how can I forget about you? So there's something here about identity and forgetfulness that we have to, again, bridge that gap somehow. And you know the way I mentioned pop culture and media before, it's interesting because this idea of identity crisis is not just something that affects you and I as Shias or even just other Muslims. It doesn't just affect other religious people. It affects every single human being. Everybody goes through an identity crisis at some point in their life. Most of them have no idea what to do about it. Most of them have no idea that that's actually what they're going through. Everybody goes through it. Even in pop culture, it's a very, very strong theme that comes out. You see in many of these characters that are put out there in movies and TV shows, they go through the same thing as well. They go through the same idea of having an identity crisis. And you know, yes, sometimes we can look in the Quran for advice and figure these things out. We can look in the riwayat and they give us advice here. We can give some rational arguments, sometimes that works. I actually want to jump into pop culture, actually, to see how even there, we can actually see how these themes and elements kind of bleed out there too. They're all through there too. So your pseudo homework, so to speak, will be this. How many of you are familiar, generally speaking, uh, with the character of Superman? Nobody? Okay. <laughs> you don't have to be shy. It's okay. This is not like, you're not going to get in trouble, right? Just because it's the month of suffer. Just because you say that, you do that. I, I know who Superman is, by the way. That's right. Okay. So those of you who don't know, if your kids know, then you can talk a little bit about that. Tomorrow, what we're going to do, inshallah, Allah give us a tawfiq, is figure out how does this story of Superman, his origin and everything, what does that have to do with an identity crisis and identity loss? And what we're going to try to show is that the same things that happened to him are the same things that happened to you and I. And we can see how that has affected our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. One more salawat. Oh, sorry. So I forgot to ask for a time check in the beginning. When should I end by? Also, you don't have an idea. You know what happens to people when they sit on the member? I'm going to go till 10 p.m. You have, to, you have to give me a time. All right, let me, let me, let's, I think we should end with Masaib right now. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We are slowly remembering and getting ourselves, getting our hearts reconnected to the tragedy of Karbala as we are following the story of the Haram of Rasulullah, the women, the children, the few men who are left over, who are now, inshallah, on these days, they're making their way back to Karbala. And inshallah, we'll discuss that on Arba'een when they finally do reach. But it's impossible to fully comprehend and to do justice to Arba'een without bringing our hearts back to Karbala one more time. We have to remember what exactly took place there. What broke the hearts of all the members of the Ahlul Bayt on that day of Ashura. And we bring our minds and our hearts and our memories back to that Asr time of Ashura where Imam Sajjad himself narrates. He says that on that day, on that afternoon, 
He said, a person opens the flap of my tent and walks inside, and I look at this man and I don't recognize who this person is. He says, I look at him head to toe, there's marks, there's strikes, there's blood, there's bruises. He says, I have no idea who this person is. And then this person says, Ya Bunaya. Oh my bet, oh my son, I'm giving you my akhir salam. I'm giving you my final salams. And Imam Sajjad says, This is when I realized that this is my father. I couldn't even recognize my father on the Asr of Ashura. The way that he looked, I had no idea that this was my father. Imagine what pain, what difficulty Imam Hussein had gone through as he had to carry each and every body back from the battlefield back to the tents over and over again. And then Imam Sajjad is confused. He says, Baba, why are you giving me your final salams? I don't understand. Aina Habib ibn Mudahir. What, what's going on over here? His Bunayya qad qutil. He's been killed. Aina Muslim ibn Usaja. Bunayya qad qutil. Muslim ibn Usaja has been killed. Baba, Aina Ammu Abbas. Where is my uncle Abbas? Bunayya qad qutil. He's been killed. Aina Akhi Ali Al Akbar. Where's my brother Ali Al Akbar? Bunayya qad qutil. Aina Qasim. Aina An. Aina Muhammad. Where is everyone? Bunayya, Bunayya qad qutil, qad qutil, qad qutil. They've all been killed until he finally says, even your young brother Ali Al Asghar is now buried in the back of the tent. Imagine how Imam Sajjad felt when he heard his six-month-old young brother is now buried behind him in the tents. Ajrukum ala Allah. When Imam Sajjad hears this, he says, look, Imam Sajjad's telling him the, the, the fight with the Yazidi forces has started. I am the last, we are the last males left. I am now giving you my final salams. This is my wida to you. I'm going out and I'm going towards shahada. When Imam Sajjad hears this, he asks Pupi Amma Zainab, help me up. He starts to get up. He says, give me my sword. He grabs his sword. And he begins going towards the tent. <laughs> Hussein says, Beta, where are you going? My son, Bonaya, where are you going? He says, Baba, how can I let you go out there? I still have John. I still have blood. I have breath in me. I'm going to go out and fight for you. He says, No, Bonaya, no, my son. Your difficulty is soon to come. You still have Kufa. You still have Sham. Soon you'll be back here. Don't worry. You still have much more Masaib to go through. You have to protect. Zainab, you have to protect Sakina, the children, the women. This is your duty now. You are the Imam after me. You have much more difficulties after this. Imam must continue with you. Imam Hussein now goes. He tries to set out there. He goes, he calls Zainab, Zainab, walk with me one last time. <laughs> when he goes with his last walk with Zainab, as they're going, they're, as brother and sister, their last walk, the famous historians tell us that this is where Zainab says to Hussein, Hussein, can you open your collar for me a little bit? <laughs> he opens his collar and Zainab begins kissing the neck of Hussein. <laughs> he says, Zainab, what, are you, what is this strange thing that you are doing? He says, don't you know the last wasiya of our amma, of our mother Fatima was that, don't you know Hussein, one day a blunt dagger will we put on his beloved neck before he leaves you for the last time kiss his neck before he goes some riwayat some historians say then Imam Hussein remembers he comes he says Zainab let me see your wrist now <laughs> Zainab says here, so why? He begins kissing the wrists of Zainab. He says, now, what is this thing you're doing? He says, the last wasiya of our Baba of Ali was that one day when you are going out and you're about to give your life, kiss the wrists of Zainab because she will be taken in ropes, in chains, moved around like a slave, treated like a non-Muslim, taken around without showing any sort of ihtiram to her in front of non-mahram men in this way. Make sure you kiss the wrist of Zayna before you go out. Ajrukum Allah. Now Hussein is being helped by Zainab on Zuljana on the horse. He says to Zuljana, this is our last ride together. Let's go out to the battlefield. He and Zuljana refuses to move. Zuljana is not going out to the battlefield. He says, come on Zuljana, I know that you are tired. I'm tired too. I know you haven't had water. I haven't had water as well. After you leave me at the battlefield, you'll be done with me. Your wazifa will be finished. Your duty with me will be done. Don't worry. But it's as if Zuljana pointed to his hind leg and Sakina was holding on to this back leg saying no Baba don't go back <laughs> Baba every time somebody else went out they never came back Ammu Abbas Chacha Abbas went out for water he never came back his body was never returned Qasim went out he didn't come back bro. 
on Muhammad nobody came back alive Baba I know what's happening here I know that you will come back alive so finally Zain, uh, Hussein and Sakina he comes down he hugs his, his daughter one last time it says Sakina I have to go out this is what I have to do this Baba are you going to give your life for Islam is that what you're doing look look at the ma'rifat of a young girl like this are you give, are you doing Islam are you going out to give your life for Islam yes I'm going out for the sake of Allah okay Baba then you can go but there's one request that I have from you what is it can I sleep on your chest one more time before you go out Baba you you know I can't sleep without you. They say that Hussein laid down on the sands of Karbala, Sakina laid down on the chest of his, her father one more time and they slept together for a few moments there. Then she took him off and said, Sakina, now you must go at night. I know I won't be there, but please, Zainab ko tang mat karo. Don't annoy your aunt Zainab. Go to sleep with her. Listen to what she says. Now, when we fast forward and we're looking at Sham e Gariba, <laughs> when when Sakina is running out, Baba, Baba, where are you? The famous story tells us that when Zainab goes and finally finds Sakina laying down by a headless body, by the legs of a headless body, Zainab and Unkulfum say, Sakina, Betty, what are you doing over here by this body? Why are you laying down like this among by the feet? He said, this is my Baba Hussein. He said, how do you know that this is Hussein? There's no head on this body. There's no clothes on this body. There's no way to identify this body. He said, it's because, don't you know, Pupi Amma, when I was running out into the deserts, when I was running all alone, when I was trying to put out the fire on my clothes, when I was calling out, I said, Baba, Baba. He said, I heard a voice calling me, Elaya, Elaya, Bodeya, Aja, Aja. Sakina, come to me one more time. I heard that voice and I ran to this body said okay Sakina I understand that but why are you sleeping by the feet why aren't you sleeping on the chest of your father why aren't you sleeping on the chest of your Baba he says well I wanted to I wanted to sleep but when I did that the bones were broken and it was as if I was like <laughs> it was as if I was laying down on the sand itself I couldn't get any comfortable <laughs> Allah la'natullahi ala qawmi al-zalimeen wa sayya'lamu al-lazina zalamu ayyamun qalibin yan qalibun inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon ridan bin qadaihi wa tasliman li amri Matam ya Hussain